Yeah, hello again, Thomas here. Um, this is talk number five, case studies on privacy. And um, yeah, the content is we have a look on physical intrusion detection. So we try to find out whether there are strip, um, yeah, people walking through the building, uh, which are not supposed to be there. We talk about proper hand washing, um, even in this times, very important. And um, yeah, I show you some methodology of data mining and building automation systems. So I, I can show you what to do with the data that comes out of the building automation system. Uh, the objectives are we draw attention to non-standard applications of data from building automation. So everything that involves uh, human behavior is uh, in focus here. Um, basically, this raises some questions. So can we detect the presence of people inside the building? Um, can we tell how many people use certain rooms or corridors during the day? Can we determine what the current situation is? For instance, are there any ongoing lectures in a room or is there a fire alarm where everybody is uh, are trying to flee and to, to leave the building? Can we detect where the people are? Where is a particular person at any particular time? And can we detect physical intrusion in a building, so use the building automation system uh, as kind of an alarm system. And finally, uh, who refuses to wash his hands in the restrooms uh, might be an important question. Uh, I have to admit that we did this research um, quite some years ago, so actually before the current situation uh, with the coronavirus. So uh, yeah, there, there's another application nowadays for this research. Uh, physical intrusion detection is the first part. So uh, yeah, there are some, some let's say handcrafted slides. This uh, is our office building. It yeah, pretty much looks the same. And inside there are a lot of corridors and stairways. And um, yeah, all those uh, corridors uh, are equipped with um, yeah, infrared presence detecting sensors, which I've shown uh, you and um, our aim, our goal is now to uh, find out whether the people be, uh, yeah, the people walking through the corridors are behaving well or misbehaving in a way. So um, yeah, we want to, to find out whether we are able to tell whether someone is stealing um, some computer components or anything else. and. Uh, is bringing this to the parking lot. So as I said, um, the building automation system uh, is equipped with window blinds, heating systems, lighting, air conditioning, so all the usual stuff you have in a, in a building. And um, yeah, in the, in the corridors, there are a lot of infrared presence detecting sensors. So here I have uh, marked them with S1, S2 and S3. There are also some light switches which um, are placed in, in offices and in corridors, which allow us to uh, yeah, determine whether someone is present because if a light button is switched, obviously there must be someone in the closed vicinity. So um, we use those, those systems and uh, you probably remember our KNX lines and KNX devices. So what we actually did in our experiments is we uh, connected uh, to one of those lines. And at the time we did so, uh, we were able to read the traffic from the entire floor. So from the third floor, the floor where our offices are, are in. And uh, we collected all those data and put them in a database. So at the end, uh, the database is representing kind of a time series because yeah, we have our three sensors, we have the time and the x-axis, and we can tell which sensor fires at which time. So the next step, yeah, we, we do have a look on the log data. Um, we have quite a lot of, of, of information. So approximately 40,000 telegrams per average working day for the third floor are in the database. And uh, yeah, as you see, this is uh, yesterday's uh, log while uh, Johannes was in a talk. So there was not 
too much motion in the corridors because yeah, actually the building currently is, is quite empty. So we have only a few sensor events in the building. What you can see here is a sequence number, a timestamp, um, and basically the sensor address and uh, yeah, all the details about TPCI and uh, payload uh, we have been talking in about uh, in the first lecture. So we are able to collect those data. We are able to place them or to interpret them as a time series. And um, yeah, we want to, to know who is uh, yeah, walking through the corridors. Is it a well-behaving person or is it any, any thief or any, any criminal that, that does something unusual at least? So in fact, we have more than 60 sensors, 60 infrared presence detecting sensors for the third floor. And um, yeah, we have uh, plenty of data. We have um, a couple of years of data. Um, let's, let's assume we have one year, which is sufficient for, for our experiment. So we, we want to use those data to train a, in this case, a support vector machine, which is um, an implementation of uh, machine learning. Um, we yeah, have quite some good experience with uh, support vector machine um, because um, yeah, it works, works quite well. So what we have to, to look at are the features. Um, in this case, I've just yeah, put on the slides two, two features. One is in the x-axis, one in the y-axis and um, yeah, a support vector machine um, allows us to, to draw a line between the, the good features or the good um, data points on the upper left side and the yeah, not so good, the bad uh, data on the lower right side. So um, we are, we are able to collect a lot of data that represents well-behaving people. Actually, there has not been any, any theft in the building, so we were not able to collect data that represents some, some misbehaving people. So what we did is um, we yeah, set up a simulation um, which causes a person to run in a way we believe that would represent a not so well behavior. And uh, we use that simulated data um, to, to train our, our support vector machine and uh, yeah, to tell or to have some, some training data for, for, the, for, the, for the bad case as well. Um, Features was something we, we uh, discussed. So, um, for instance, we talk about 15 um, features from the data or 15 attributes with values, then it's called a feature. So, for instance, uh, we took the time since the last event for a particular sensor, the time since the last event in the database um, in the general, so in the overall database. We also uh, took the current time into account because usually at night time there's uh, much fewer traffic in the building and any motion in the night or during the night might cause uh, some suspicion. We also have the sensor ID, actually the position of the sensors, which we did not take into account. We, we yeah, didn't give the system any, any information about the, the metadata, where the sensors are placed which sensors are neighbors and so on. We did not use this at this time. Only plain data. The type of event, so whether it is a yeah, light switch um, or actually uh, somebody switching on a light or switching off a light, which is a type of event, or somebody passing an infrared presence detecting sensor. And uh, we also took into account number of events during the last 15 minutes, for instance. We, we also took a lot of, or not a lot, but some other features into account, but uh, those here are yeah, representative for the, um, for the, for the features we, we took. Yeah, and, and finally, um, we were able um, to, to run our system. Um, and um, yeah, 
the results were quite promising. Usually you take into account um, precision and recall as quality parameters for yeah, anyway, any, any classification algorithms in machine learning. So there are, um, are in, in all the data points we have, there are some relevant data. So relevant means uh, they represent an attack. Um, and then our algorithm selects some data points. So the selected ones out of the relevant ones are the true positives. The selected ones out of the non-relevant ones are the false positives and um, yeah, the false negatives and true negatives are the residue or the remainder that, that yeah, remains after removing the selected data points. Um, so precision means uh, the selected relevant, so the true positives divided by the selected or by the number of the selected. So actually we have to put number or sign around this yeah, pies here. Um, the recall is the true positives divided by the relevance. So by the number of relevance. Um, actually the, the problem here is to, to use those um, criteria to tell how well this algorithm works. Uh, we, we need to know what a data point is and or we need to define what a data point is. Actually, the problem here is uh, that every sensor event would be a data point. Um, this would cause the precision to go down rapidly and the recall to go down rapidly because a single data point doesn't say anything. So actually, we did run the algorithm for any data point. Um, there's a history for some data points, for instance, so uh, time since the last event, for instance, is uh, one of the features. So actually, uh, we have kind of a sliding window. Um, we also take into account uh, the last 15 minutes and so on. So um, it did not work or it, yeah, it actually does not work that we, we take uh, every uh, particular sensor event um, as a data point into account to calculate uh, precision and recall. So um, yeah, we, we had a look at, at different other parameters. Here on the, on the lower left side, you see the number of events um, per um, day for different days of the week. So the blue, the dark blue and the green curve are representing Saturdays and Sundays. And you see there is a yeah, kind of a structure in the data because um, yeah, our, our lectures are in a two hour scheme. So they usually start at nine o'clock at 11 o'clock and so on. So uh, the number of uh, people running through the corridors corresponds with that um, starting times of the lectures. Um, you can you can really see this in, in the data and uh, yeah as you see there's a a peak uh, in the morning at let's say five o'clock around five o'clock uh, this is uh, the the cleaning stuff so when they open the room um, they go through the corridors they they uh, yeah empty the the paper bins and um, yeah they, they clean everything basically they, they run through the building um, in the in the right curve on the right chart, you say you see um, the number of um, events that were necessary, or the, the number of sorry number of simulated people that caused events, simulated bad people that caused events uh, necessary to raise an alert in our system. So uh, for a weekend, uh, it is sufficient to have uh, one person, one additional person during the night. During the day when there are, let's say, hundred, hundreds of students uh, running through the corridors per hour, for instance, uh, adding just one more person doesn't, doesn't cause any, yeah, any, any alert. But um, 
during the weekend the system works very fine during the night the system works very fine so um, yeah the support vector machine is uh, a sufficient method to uh, categorize behavior into well-behaving people or non so well-behaving people um, we were able to improve the quality of our system by removing some data points because um, some yeah, events are triggered by non-human action. For instance, um, a temperature value in the KNX lock doesn't say much about human behavior. It's somehow it does, but actually it's not a direct um, yeah, it's not directly related to any human behavior. While as uh, running through a corridor and causing a an infrared presence detecting sensor to fire or somebody pressing a light switch is a direct human interaction with the system. So when we received those let's say noise data from the from the database that was caused by non-human um, behavior so that was not caused by human behavior let's put it that way um, then the system uh, reacted yeah, a bit a bit better because uh, yeah there's not too much noise left in the in the data everything uh, is uh, let's say stripped down to uh, data or to events being triggered by human beings yeah so this shows uh, how a little bit of machine learning and uh, a lot of data being collected can be used to yeah, implement a kind of an intrusion detection system, a physical intrusion detection system, um, purely based on the data already available in a building automation system. So we did not install any extra device. We simply used what we already got from the building automation system. Um, let's let's have, a, have, have another, uh, yeah. Let's talk about another idea. So you remember this is our corridor. We have a lot of KNX infrared presence detecting sensors. So the uh, red parts here and we have a lot of light switches, the, the blue parts, the blue boxes here. And um, yeah, by the way, this is um, before the update. Uh, there, there has been an update in the in the building. So currently the uh, distance between those sensors is much higher because um, it did not work properly. So when you, uh, yeah, when you uh, left, you know, when you, when you, when the person left the office um, and there was no infrared presence detecting sensor sensing this the light uh, did not did not go on um, so hence for instance here in the in the in the picture for room 369 uh, there's no light or no presence detector in the vicinity so uh, the, the person had to to walk a bit through the dark before the first uh, sensor triggered and before the light went on. Um, so let's let's talk about proper hand washing at this time. Um, we use again the same sensors. We use the infrared presence detecting sensors to tell something about proper hand washing. So um, yeah, yesterday someone mentioned uh, the NHS. Um, I did look, or I have looked. Uh, I was I was looking for a yeah, for a demonstration uh, how how to to probably wash your own hands um, hand washing technique with soap and water um, so it's um, explained here in, in yeah very detail um, but the the main information that is necessary is uh, how long does it take um, nowadays there are those yeah manuals how to wash your hands in, in almost every language so this is the same the equivalent from the german or authorities um, yeah the main information here is proper hand washing takes about 15 to 30 minutes 
Um, yeah, remember this. Uh, if you if you have a look on the left hand side, so uh, the the rooms above three seven one, there are sensors three six six, three six five, three six four, and in the corridor there's three six eleven and three five forty five. Um, those sensors 366 and 365 are they are installed to switch on the light. If someone uh, directly goes into the toilet, there's no light switch. Um, if there's some presence, the light goes on in the room. And as I said, there's no window, so this is the only source of light. Um, and uh, yeah, we pretty much rely on those sensors. Um, and the, the sink, the washing sink is in uh, 364 or in the room uh, that has sensor 364 in it. And um, yeah, you can imagine if somebody runs out of the um, back room, so passes 365, then 364, and then let's say 3611, we can tell how long it took those person to run through the room with the with the um, sinks with the wa washing facilities, so um, it was pretty easy to uh, collect this data. And um, yeah, um, as I said, um, there are some people who walk through that room within less than twenty seconds. 15 to 30 seconds was uh, the, the British uh, standard for proper hand washing. For Germany, it was 20 to 25 or 20 to 30 seconds. So um, everything below 20 seconds or 15 seconds is not, does mean uh, that this person did not properly wash its hands. Um, I don't tell you which of the two shards represents the female and the male toilet. Uh, you can you can make a guess. Um, it's it might be different than you than you thought. Um, yeah, so the dirty piglets are in this bar. So there are eight occurrences, or a bit more than eight occurrences uh, per day in average um, of people out of a lot of people that did not wash pro that, that did not probably wash their hands so we came up with a model uh, we modeled the corridor so we gave sensor different names s10 s9 s8 and so on but um, those sensors represent um, yeah our our real sensors uh, and the idea here is um, again not only to give a statistics, which is actually not a huge problem in terms of privacy, but also to um, have a look uh, at specific people, specific employees or students, for instance, and tell yeah, who of them is not properly washing its hands every time. Uh, his or her hands. Um, so um, what we did is we we did run a Monte, Car a Monte Carlo simulation. Actually, we used a particle filter, and um, yeah, it works like follows. Um, at a specific time, for instance, at the first sensor event in the database, um, we generate, let's say, a million virtual people. And um, yeah, those people are represented by uh, those blue boxes here. And um, then we gave them certain parameters. So for instance, the walking speed. Um, they, we, we even found a, an interesting research paper about the average walking speed of a university employees in Europe, I think. Um, and uh, by the way, some um, people, some researchers did even calculate the, the average uh, uh, 
expected lifetime left for an employee by uh, using the walking speed. So there's a, yeah, a, a it correspondence uh, with, the, with the walking speed, obviously. If you're dead, you're not walking, but uh, yeah, there's a better, better relation than this. Um, so we gave, or actually the, the, the working principle of um, um, particle filters is that um, yeah, you, you simulate a lot of people um, and you give them certain parameters. In our case, they have different walking speeds. So some of them are walking very fast um, and very with high speed and uh, some of them are walking with lower speeds. So here you see there are already some people in the corridor while some other people who are walking slower uh, are still in the, uh, in the, in the back room. Um, yeah, the animation is a bit misleading. So actually pe uh, the, the people are, or the virtual people, the particles are walking further away with time over time and yeah then um, we give them certain attributes so um, those people who are already on the corridor at this time belong to the group of um, people who did not wash their hands mm, let's have a look at the particle filter in a bit more detail so uh, this is a yeah, kind of a one-dimensional uh, walking path so actually one of the parameters is speed of people and another parameter is their destination and their pass they walk through the building so actually every possible pass was represented by a couple of virtual people a couple of particles um, this means yeah we have created, as I said, a million virtual particles or virtual people. And um, yeah, there's a good chance that some of those particles represent the true behavior of, of people walking through the corridors. So what happens? We, yeah, in a simulation, we let, let the particles walk through a corridor. Here, the corridor is just a line, so there's no, no second dimension and uh, then we have a sensor event and we know the the range of the sensor so what we do is we increase a parameter which is called the weight of uh, particles who are in the range of the sensor that just fired uh, what you see here is the the red area yeah the red area marks the range of the sensor. So every particle that is at this time when the sensor fired in our simulation underneath such a sensor, so in the range of the sensor, um, gets an increased value. So the weight is being increased and um, yeah, those, those particles might represent um, people that did actually trigger the sensor event. But here we look at the problem from the other side. We assume the sensor event caused some particles to increase their weight. Uh, over time, it used to happen that uh, yeah, the people, the virtual people arrive at a different sensor and uh, when this sensor fired, those virtual people, virtual particles get their weight even more increased. Um, as you see, the density of particles uh, represents the, uh, the distribution of walking speeds, actually. Uh, the average person uh, walks with a speed that uh, represents the peak of the density of particles. Yeah, what we have is a lot of um, particles and they have different weights. Um, the weight represents 
how many times a specific particle was hit by a sensor event. In reality, a particle representing a person that caused the sensor event gets a higher weight. Um, another parameter for those sensors are, or for those particles is, uh, for all particles is, how long it took them to pass the washroom. So we can now tell which person, which virtual person did first, did not properly wash his or her hands, and second, did cause sensor events, real sensor events. And uh, if you look at the data for a longer time, so let's say we collect a couple of runs between the toilet and the office, we are able to issue score values. So for those particles that represent uh, that represent non-proper hand washing, we are able to tell where those people went, where those virtual people went. So in a consequence thereof, we can tell which room has which score values in terms of hygiene. Um, so again, we know the dirty piglets. And uh, as you see, this is a, yeah, a, a clear breach of privacy. And um, yeah, for, for an employer, it might be important to know this, but um, actually for an employee, you don't want your employer to know how much time you spend in the toilet, how often you walk there, and uh, how much time you spend on, on hand washing. Um, there are a lot of other questions that can be answered the same way, for instance, who uses public transport, um, who's, who's smoking. Um, you might even tell um, who has a certain illness because um, yeah, they, they run in a different speed or uh, they run in a, in a different pattern or they, yeah, they run more often somewhere. So let's have about uh, let's have a look on the methodology. We did look at um, a particle filter, a Monte Carlo simulation, as one means to, or one method to to solve the problem, or to deduct some information from the data. Uh, we we could also use machine learning. So uh, the data what we have is uh, in our case it is usually about network security, so we need information from the network. Um, in this case, it's human behavior. Records of the network traffic is not human behavior, but any person running through a building automation or a, a building equipped with a building automation system will cause certain network traffic because sensor events are represented by network traffic. Um, yeah, in this case, the physical layer and maybe a bit of a link layer is um, involved um, in this example here. So we have recorded telegrams, transmissions, voltage values over time. This is important for network security. So maybe someone has interfered with the network, someone has uh, installed an additional device. But the same, as described here, the same information can also be used to monitor human behavior. Um, so the events in the database also represent human behavior in, in some cases. There are some events that are caused by, let's say, a temperature sensor or by, by a timer or something. This does not represent human behavior, but as I told you, uh, a lot of events are triggered by people running through the corridors or people, uh, yeah, switching on the light and off and so on. <clears throat> um, the problem is we, we want to separate the good data from the bad data. So the 
well-behaving people for the from the non so well-behaving people. Uh, we could also detect anomalies or outliers if we assume that the majority of people is well-behaving then an outlier is somebody or something, some event that raises suspicion. Yeah, what we also like is, yeah, we, we, we like finding the most suitable characteristics and procedures that solve our problems. So the, the best features, for instance, understand the system better. So we might be able to tell uh, how, how the, the university works how students work, how employees work. Um, maybe we find some simple rules that will help us to solve the problem easily. The problem here is detecting people who do not wash their hands or detecting people walking through corridors at night and stealing something or um, on the more technical side, um, any network packets, network telegrams that arrive um, without a, a course that is yeah, supposed to be in the system. So anything that is not supposed in a system, any, any message, any telegram that is not supposed in a system should raise an alert. Um, again, you probably know about machine learning. Uh, you know a lot about machine learning. So machine learning is the field of study that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. Uh, we don't want rules. We want the system to learn itself how the world behaves normally and um, if there's something different. Or we want the system to learn how to classify well-behaving people and non-well-behaving people or how to classify um, students and employees, something like that. A computer program is set to learn from experience E with respect to some task T and some performance measure P. If its performance on T as measured by P improves with experience E, another definition of uh, machine learning. Um, so without machine learning, this is the, the problem might look like this. We have rules. A rule might be uh, look at the sensor events, look uh, how much time did, uh, did pass since the last event. If, so if is a rule, an if clause in, in programming. You might have, let's say, a multi-level if clause in your program code. So let's say 12 stages. Uh, you see there's a lot of knowledge necessary to create such a rule. Um, yeah, if you have yeah, a lot of rules, you usually make mistakes and it's very hard to deduct those rules from, from the knowledge you have. Then you evaluate whether the rules work or not. If they work, you launch the program. If they don't work, you analyze errors, you study the problem again, and then you write rules, you evaluate, if everything works, you launch, you launch the problem, uh, the program. So uh, with machine learning, it looks a bit different. So you train a machine learning algorithm with a lot of data you collect during runtime or maybe in advance um, before running the system, then you evaluate your solution and again, if, they are, if it's not working, you analyze the error, you study the problem again, you train the machine learning algorithm with the same data or maybe with new data. You take different features into account, you add more features, you add more sensors, whatever. And then you evaluate the solution again and then you launch the program. Um, human learning, so this is what we also like, as in a slide some slides uh, before. Human learning with the help of machine learning. So uh, you study the problem, you train the machine learning algorithm. The system generates a solution, you inspect the solution. And now yeah, you, you get some insights. You, you get a better understanding of the problem. And then you can iterate this. Um, this works very well for, let's say, support vector machines, because 
they tell you how they look internally at the end it's just a a, a discriminant between two sets of, of data points and there's a simple rule at the end so a trained support vector machine is very small uh, while as for instance a neural network uh, is very hard to comprehend for a human being because uh, the weights on the on the neurons on the transmitters don't tell you anything and there might be a lot of neurons in the network uh, in the neural network and uh, hence yeah it's very hard to comprehend and you you probably never understand what it learned um yeah why why do we want to use machine learning instead of rules for instance machine learning is great for problems with, uh, for which existing solutions require a lot of fine-tuning or long rule lists so as i said a rule list uh, or a rule hierarchy with yeah, 12 levels usually is uh, not a great solution a machine learning algorithm can often simplify the code and perform better than the traditional approach even if it's kind of spooky because you don't know what the machine learning algorithm is doing but at the end it might work complex problems for which a traditional approach does not provide a good solution so the best machine learning techniques may be able to find a solution fluctuating environments so machine learning system can adapt to new data if for instance um, yeah there there is let's say a lockdown in the university everybody has to stay at home there's there are no students um, this might be unusual for a trained system so it might raise an alert something is going on maybe there's a problem with the sensors or maybe there's a fire in the building or whatever the system has learned um, but um, in a machine learning algorithm or machine learning environment you don't have to reprogram all the rules if you did this manually uh, the system will adapt over time to the new situation maybe at the beginning or maybe uh, at, at the point in time when the new situation started uh, the system generated a lot of false alerts false positives so in this case you would need to uh, teach the system or to train the system again um, but at the end uh, the same code the same uh, program runs with different data and different knowledge different experience remember the e different experience it has uh, gained so gain knowledge about complex problems and large amount of data might be another reason to use machine learning instead of roots because yeah if you use this to explore your problem you can learn something classification there are yeah, supervised unsupervised semi-supervised or reinforcement learning systems um, this is one dimension so it tells us whether or not they are trained under human supervision if they need a human to tell them yeah this is a well-behaving person and this is an attacker this is called a supervised learning basically it's supervised if you can to the training data if you can apply labels to the training data to every data point if you let's say apply the label attacker or normal user to a data point then it's supervised uh, supervised learning unsupervised learning is the system has to come up with some solutions itself for instance it has to cluster all the data and then uh, yeah everything that is not within one of the clusters might be suspicious this is unsupervised learning in unsupervised learning in the training phase you cannot apply labels to the data points semi-supervised uh, means um, yeah for some data points during the training phase you you have a label for others you don't reinforcement learning is um, a yeah, different approach you have an agent the agent behaves in a, in a specific way and if the agent makes a mistake 
it learns something from uh, yeah increasing or decreasing certain weights on certain parameters it has used to determine uh, yeah whether uh, this the, this is an attack or not for instance so let's say um, a little child learns by touching a hot um, surface uh, that this might be hot so um, it learns something and uh, at the end it would not touch anything that looks hot this the same for a computer program for an agent uh, the agent has a parameter that tells it yeah it did survive it did perform better or something or it did burn its hands and then uh, yeah, this parameter can be used for reinforcement learning to to tell whether uh, yeah, the, the solution is a good one or, or should be improved. Whether or not they can learn incrementally on the fly, online versus batch learning. In our case, um, yeah, the system is um, changing over time. There might be more students or less students, different lectures and whatever uh, that will be reflected in the features we took, in the features we have chosen. Um, and hence we use on-the-fly learning. So we do not uh, let the system run, let's say, for the first two weeks of every semester or for the first two weeks of any semester break. We let the system run constantly and uh, let it learn constantly. So we take a kind of a sliding window. Um, maybe the sliding window might be two years, one year, five years, whatever the cycle of um, behavior is. There is, there is a yeah, a strong difference in the in the usage of a university building, for instance, uh, for semester time and for semester breaks. So um, the system might learn this over time when the semester starts, depending on the features you choose to train the system. Um, yeah, whether the work simply by yeah, well, another comparison or another category to um, classify machine learning systems are or is whether they work simply by comparing new data points with known data points or instead recognize patterns in the training data and create a predictive model similar to what scientists do. So the first is called instant-based versus model-based learning. Let's have a look at supervised learning again. In supervised learning, the training data set that uh, is fed into the algorithm contains the desired solutions, the so-called labels. These labels are missing in the test data set. So they are in the training data set. Obviously, a human being has applied those labels to the data points. Typical examples, spam detection using classification. So at the beginning, if you have a specific spam where filter for yourself, you have to train it by showing it all your good emails and showing it all your spam emails. Um, this is important for people who, for instance, work in a pharmacy and sell something. So for them, uh, different keywords would apply. Um, keywords is not the state of the art for spam detection anymore. I know that, but uh, yeah, typical example spam detection using classification on the words or maybe on a Markov chain or whatever uh, current algorithm is being used. But in most cases, the training with examples from those two classes, spam and hem or spam and normal email you want, uh, would, would, would be the first phase of the system. Yeah, the prediction of values, for instance, the price of a car-based on features such as mileage, age, brand, type, color, um, yeah, is called regression. This is another example for supervised learning. So our support vector machine is also supervised learning because yeah, all the data points have labels. You see the, the dots and the axes are across an X. Across means uh, the bad person down there and uh, the dot actually is the good person. Yeah, we have been talking about features and attributes a bit. Uh, in machine learning, an attribute is a data type. 
for instance, mileage. While a feature has several meanings depending on the context, but generally means an attribute plus its value. Um, I did what many people did. I did use the two words uh, synonymously, which means I do not, yeah, I do not um, make a difference between attribute and feature. I use feature most of the time. But in general, an attribute is meant and um, an attribute with a value is a feature. So um, we have been talking about a lot of features, uh, time of day, uh, sensor, uh, ID that caused the event and so on before. So those are typical features or typical attributes. Yeah, a <clears throat> um, simple algorithm is classification. So here uh, the division into classes is the, the basic principle. We train the system with examples uh, whose class is known. It has a label as said. Um, regression works. The task is to predict a numerical target value such as the price of a car or the danger of a KNX telegram or the danger post by or the danger uh, caused by a tele the KNX telegram. Given a set of features, for instance, mileage, age, make, in case of the car, or source address, destination address, etc., in case of KNX packets. This is called a predictor. On the right hand side, you see um, those uh, data points. And uh, the question is for a new instance, what value is to expect? So the feature. Yeah, might end up in a in the close vicinity of the of the um, uh, yellow dots, so it might be a rather high value in this case. If the new instance would be a bit a further bit to the right, uh, the value might be lower. We can use this regression in s several ways. Yeah, it could be a linear regression. Then you just have a line. But this one here doesn't look very linear. So I would apply, let's say, a, yeah, a curve of, of the third degree or something uh, to approximate uh, all the data points here, all the training data, all the predictors. Um, best known algorithms for supervised learning are k neighbors or k nearest neighbors, regression, support vector machine, decision trees, random forest, neural networks, to name a few. Unsupervised learning means in unsupervised learning the training data are not labeled. Um, typical algorithms are clustering, anomaly detection, novelty dis detection, um, visualization, and dimensionality reduction, principal component analysis, kernel analysis, uh, logical linear embedded bidding LLEs and so on. So there are a lot of, uh, of algorithms. Um, clustering, a method that is yeah, well known for, or is, is often used in case of unsupervised learning. Here the task is to find groups of objects that are similar. And if you look at the training data, yeah, you can decide to have, let's say, four clusters. You can have more, but uh, the more clusters you have, the fewer people you, you have, the, the more uncertainty you have about the borders of a cluster. Um, but here, yeah, it looks pretty, not obvious, but um, it looks favorable to have four clusters. Um, and the four clusters are shown in the in the second diagram. It is also possible to have hierarchical clustering. So within a cluster, you find new clusters or more clusters, depending on the yeah, number of dimensions of features you have. So um, having this hierarchical clustering in uh, a two dimensional feature set with, let's say, um, only 20 data points does not make much sense. Um, in cases uh, where you have, let's say, 200 features, 
and uh, 10 million uh, training data points or training a, a data set uh, with yeah, 10 million data points in it. Uh, in this case, a hierarchical clustering system would, would be preferable. Uh, once again, one cluster here might represent the well-behaving people and another cluster might represent the attackers. Um, by the way, I'm only using two features because it's easier to depict in a two-dimensional medium. Um, in reality, there, there could be much more features and some features could be derived from the data. And if you look at, let's say, the physical layer, which usually does not directly um, yeah, corresponds with our human behavior. But if you look at the physical layer, you can you can derive, let's say, 2000 features from um, any any time series. During training, the system is usually shown normal instances so that it learns to recognize them. This is anomaly detection. When the system then sees a new instance, it can tell whether it looks like a normal or whether it is probably an anomaly. Um, how can you do that? For instance, um, if your K neighbors neighbors are far away, you are an outlier. If all your neighbors are living in one direction, you are an outlier. Living in one direction means um, you can you can determine the um, the angle between uh, all your neighbors, and uh, if they if the sector is very small, then uh, you are probably an outsider. Um, yeah, the same if if you live in the middle of a village or of a town, all your neighbors are living around you. If you live outside the town, all your neighbors are living in one direction. The direction towards the town so the angle can be used the same with the with the distance if you live within the, t the city center or the town center all your neighbors are nearby if you live outside yeah the next 10 neighbors are further away this can be used to detect an anomaly uh, i don't want to say that anybody not living in the city center is kind of kind of an outlier uh, but here again, um, the normal people are in in that yeah in that cloud, and the the anomalies are the are the attackers. As I said, semi supervised learning means um, yeah some uh, data points have labels and some don't have. Um, so we use the labels here, for instance, to form clusters. And um, yeah, there's a. If you look here, there's a, an area between the two clusters that is not so much populated, not so densely populated with data points. Uh, in this case, um, the new data point, the one that is marked with the arrow and the class mark here, and the class question mark here. Uh, and the class and the question mark here, sorry, um, this data point reflects obviously, or I would say, um, a green triangle rather yeah, sure and does not reflect a yellow, yeah, what is it, square. Reinforcement learning, as I said, the learning system called agent in this context can observe the environment, select and perform actions and receive rewards or penalties in the form of negative rewards. It must then learn for itself what the best strategy, a so-called policy is in order to receive the greatest rewards over time. So as a little child, observe, select action using policy, perform the action, get reward or policy. So, uh, sorry, get reward or penalty. A penalty might be uh, you burnt your hands. A policy defines what action the agent should take when he finds himself in a certain situation. Yeah, so much for some methods to 
classify, to cluster uh, uh, data points in order to tell whether uh, they belong to one site or another. In most cases, you can apply rules, a rule-based system. Uh, in some cases, it is preferable to have machine learning algorithms. Um, there's usually another, f another force that, that yeah, causes a decision or that, that helps people to make a decision, which is uh, yeah, what is the most modern algorithm. So in, in some cases, uh, people who make the sh decisions uh, would prefer to apply machine learning because they think eh, this is the modern way. Uh, in a situation where even a simple rule could solve the problem much easier. So uh, machine learning is not always the best solution. And if people say, yeah, we need machine learning, we need, let's say, quantum cryptography, uh, then it's not always the case. We, we do not need, we, we do need to know about the, the, the methods available, but then we have to choose the right one. And uh, yeah, finally, this is a little task for you. Uh, this is data from our laboratory. Um, it shows the energy consumption over time for a couple of, um, for a minute. Yeah, it's almost a minute, yeah. Um, and what we measure is the energy consumption or the, the power consumption of uh, our coffee maker. Um, it is between yeah, two watts, which is the standby power, and let's say 1.3 or 1.4 kilowatts um, if it's brewing coffee and um, yeah, putting some steam in the milk. And uh, yeah, this is the, the time series. Um, and yeah, we have two events here. So somebody was either preparing a coffee or a cappuccino or a latte macchiato. Um, and your task is to distinguish uh, or to determine or to deduce from the power consumption what beverage has been prepared. So which one or which of the two curves represents the latte macchiato and which one represents the yeah, cappuccino, for instance. Some interesting task, you can tell. At the end, if you combine this with the hand washing example, you can tell which employee prefers which kind of coffee. Conclusion. Don't forget to wash your hands because someone might be watching you and you do not, do not need video surveillance to watch people. Um, usually it's enough to have some sensors placed in the building and it will tell a lot more about people than you yeah, might have thought at the beginning. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for attending this lecture and uh, yeah. I will be having a coffee. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to send me an email, call me later on. Um, you can even send me a letter. Um, yeah, thank you once again. I'm having a coffee now.